even spiritual fathers. Uh, during our elders meeting this past week, both spoke to some of us and mentioned that you know, we have biological fathers while we're here on earth, but the real father is the person who shows up in a young person's life. So I'm thankful for spiritual fathers as well. Amen. Um, if everyone will, say a brief little prayer for me. I haven't gotten to the point yet in my preaching where my heart doesn't beat really fast. <laughs> I might be able to conceal that, but it, it's beating. So everyone say a short little prayer for me. Um, we will be addressing fathers today. And fathers today. It makes sense, doesn't it? Um, and before we get into the message, uh, I have a few things that I, I want to mention. One being... Uh, I want to acknowledge, uh, acknowledge the fact that while I am a father, I am a young father. And I realize that I will be speaking to fathers that are older to me today. So I, I hope that I come from a place of humility uh, for everyone listening here and on Facebook Live at some point when Tyler posts that. Um, I want to come from a place of humility. And I hope that it's nothing that I say but what God says me. That's the first thing I have to take care of. Um, the second one being, I want to provide a, a brief recap on the Mother's Day message that was provided us by Bo a few weeks ago. If everyone remembers, he provided us three ways that we can honor our mothers, and really our fathers as well. Does anyone remember those three ways? Praise them. Praise. Obey. Obey. Cheer. And emulate. Emulate their faith. I have an advantage because I listened to that message just a few days ago to, to remind myself of what was said because a lot of it will overlap between Mother's Day and Father's Day, but hopefully I won't say everything that was mentioned that day. Um, and then the last thing I want to address before we get into the heart of today's message um, is Malachi chapter 4, verses 4 through 6. So if you can turn to Malachi for me real quick, that's the last book of the Old Testament. So if you know where Matthew is, just turn one book back and you'll be in Malachi. And of course, Malachi was a minor prophet, not because he was lesser, but because the book of Malachi is just a shorter book. Um, and then you have longer books in the Old Testament, and those are the major prophets. So Malachi chapter 4, verses 4 through 6. And these are the, the last words of the Old Testament. It says... Remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him in Horeb for all of Israel, with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. Uh, I wanted to... Uh, provide this to everyone to help us gain the understanding that there's a correlation between the relationship of fathers and their children and the land. If the hearts of fathers are directed towards their children, uh, the land will be blessed. But contrary to that, if fathers, if the hearts of fathers are not turned towards their children, the ensuing result will be the children will not have their hearts turned to, towards the fathers and the land will be cursed. And so I bring that up just to help us understand that there is a weightiness about this message that we're going to be diving into today. That God takes the family unit very, very seriously. And with that, let's pray and we will get into the heart of today's message. Father, I come to you and I pray that you will help me to deliver this message. I pray that it is all of you none of me, and I, pray, and I pray that you would prepare the hearts of those who will listen to this today, that they would take it to heart, and that we would honor you in the process. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. While this message will be directly towards fathers, I believe everyone here will be able to benefit from it. Um, as I said, there's, there's a lot of overlap between Mother's Day and Father's Day. Um, but I also realize that there's some young folks here who are not yet parents. I would address the, the, the young women and 
the congregation in Oman to pay attention to the characteristic of a godly man and father because that's the type of man that one day you want to marry. Yes. And then young men in the congregation in Oman um, strive towards what I'm going to be talking about today. Strive towards that so that you can honor God and that one day you will be able to honor your wife and your family. So we will be in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. And while you're turning there, um, I just want to provide a, a little bit of context. I think I've probably mentioned it before. Uh, the book of Deuteronomy contains four farewell messages from Moses to the people of Israel. And he provides them these farewell messages as they are preparing to enter the promised land. If you could summarize the book of De Deuteronomy, the main message is that if God's people obey him, he will bless them and he will bless the land. And if they disobey him, if they disobey God, he will curse the land. So Deuteronomy chapter 6. And allow me to say that um, in preaching and pastoring, think about a shepherd, he has a, a, a rod and a, a shepherd's hook, and he u utilizes both of those tools, um, both of those instruments, one to pull the sheep, and sometimes he uses the rod to, to prod the sheep. <laughs> we may be doing a little bit of prodding today, but allow me to say that we, we are coming from a place of grace. We come from grace, and we live in a place of grace. So uh, I think it was just last Sunday that Bo mentioned that. Um, in the Christian faith, God allows U-turns. So if, if you hear something today that is kind of causes a little bit of friction, understand that um, you can make a U-turn in your life and, and try to uh, rise up as, as my convention that we can strive to be better fathers, mothers, just people of God. So Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. Here we go. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. And pay attention to verse 7. Verse 7. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall buy them as a sign on your hand, and, you shall, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. The main question that I want to ask today is this. What are we as fathers? What are we as parents teaching our children? Now, some fathers teach their children to, to play baseball and t-ball. Some fathers teach their children how to hunt and fish. We're always teaching our children something, and that's the main thing we need to remember, is that we are always teaching our children, whether directly or indirectly. An example of indirectly teaching our children is the way within which we treat our wives. If we love and respect and honor our wives as fathers, hopefully our children will see that, and they likewise will honor their mother and will teach them how to treat women, right? So we're, we're always teaching our children something. And we can take it a step further and ask, what are we as fathers teaching our children about God? What are we as fathers teaching our children about God? One of my favorite pastors and authors, his name is Douglas Wilson, and Tyler listens to some of his stuff. He suggests that fathers act as theology primers for their children. What do I mean by that? Theology is nothing more than the study of God. So fathers are preparing their children to learn about God. Um, in one way or another, the way a child views his father or her father usually is the way that they are going to view God the Father one day. And he writes this. Douglas Wilson writes this. He says, fathers are speaking about God the Father constantly. They do not have the option of shutting up. What they are saying may be true or false, but they are not in a position where they can refuse to say anything. A father who just sits and stares, a father who is down at the office all of the time, a father who deserts the family, a 
father who just donated sperm at the sperm bank. All of them are speaking. Every one of them is saying something all of the time. A father who teaches his son to swing a bat. A father who listens to his daughter explain why Peter Rabbit shouldn't have disobeyed. A father who kisses their mom on the lips. A father who reads for hours to the family in the evening. All of them are speaking too. So again, what are we as fathers teaching our children? Another famous pastor named A.W. Tozer. Has anyone heard of him? Yes. He says this. He says, what comes to mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. What comes to mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. And why is that? Well, if, if we believe that God is worthy of honor and praise, we will honor and praise him. If we believe that God is distant, it's unlikely that we will pursue a relationship with him. And if we believe that God is an angry task master, we will probably revert to works righteousness and try to work really hard to appease him. So it really is important what we think about God. And fathers lay that foundation in their children's life, lives as he trains them up. And so again, what are we as fathers teaching our children? As I see it, there's really two sides of the coin when it comes to this topic. We as fathers teach who God is and what he's like, and we also teach our children what the proper response towards God should be. There's really two sides of the coin. We represent God the Father, but we also represent the way within which we should respond to God the Father because we're all children of God, right? And we'll be addressing both of these sides of the coin. So let's start first with how fathers represent who God is and what he's like. And so we need to ask ourselves, do we affirm God's spirit and character in the way that we treat our family? We can address or look at the, the fruit of the spirit that are found in the book of Galatians. You don't have to turn there, but the fruit of the spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. In all honesty, I could spend a, a complete sermon on each of these fruits. But on Father's Day, let's just address one. Let's address the fruit of love. Are we loving towards our children in the way that God the Father is loving towards us? We really love in two ways, through our words and through our actions. I must confess, it's been my experience and observation that mothers tend to get words better, a little bit better than us men. They're better at telling their children that they love them, and that they are proud of them. It's something us men, us fathers, that we can work on because sometimes it's, it's awkward for us to say these things to our children, especially as they get older. But don't you know that God provides an example for us fathers in the Bible? of what words we should say to our children. You don't have to turn there, but you can if you want to. Both Matthew chapter 317 and then Matthew chapter 17, 5, God the Father addresses Jesus the Son. It, it happens during his baptism and during his transfiguration. And I'm sure all of you know what God the Father says to Jesus in those instances. What does he say? This is my beloved Son, whom I am well pleased. Put another way, that's my boy. I'm proud of him. I love him. Do we say these things to our children? If we do, that is great. But if we don't, let us follow the example of God the Father and let our children know that we do indeed love them and that we are proud of them. I believe that children need to hear these things from their father's mouths. And they need to hear them regularly. Because what if they don't hear these things? What would the child assume? No, my, my dad doesn't love me. No, my dad is not proud of me. In fact, I think he's ashamed of me. Because if we, as fathers, are not speaking life into our children, 
I can guarantee you there is a father who is going to speak to them, the father of lies. Yeah. The devil starts to speak to children at a very early age, and he's going to try very hard to convince our children that their fathers don't love them, and that they are not proud of them. So we need to make sure that we're doing a great job of speaking life into our children's lives. Just like God the Father, we need to tell our children that we love them and that we are indeed proud of them. Again, most fathers, when their wives ask them to say I love you to their child, what does the father typically say? Well, Jimmy knows that I love him. Jimmy knows that I'm proud of him. And that may be true, but still I believe that fathers need to speak life into their children's lives. And we have a hard time saying these things. Let us write them in a note. I know that my dad, he, he typically wrote me letters. I remember reading them before cross-country matches. And he would affirm me and let me know that regardless of the outcome of the race, that he indeed loved me. But we must not stop with our words. We must love our children with our actions. If we hope to teach what God is like in the way that he loves us, we must Show them that we love them in our actions. And typically, fathers do a better job in this area, at least in these two areas, in protecting their children and providing for their children. We're typically good at doing that. But I have two, um, two little quotes from two pastors um, who speak on this subject. The first one being by Arthur Pink. He lived in 18, or was born in 1886 and died in 1952, so quite a while ago. But see if the words still apply today. He says, Nowadays, the father thinks that he has fulfilled his obligations by providing food and clothing for his children and by acting occasionally as a kind of moral policeman. If that's true of that time, how much more true is that today? I mean, many fathers today can they even say that they work to provide for their children. It's sad to say, but a lot of children don't have their fathers present in their lives. But we need to remember that providing for our children doesn't stop with the physical. God commands fathers to provide for them spiritually, and mentally, and emotionally as well. Another pastor and famous author, John Calvin, <coughs> who lived in 1509 to 1564, even older than the first, he says this, when a father has children, his responsibility is not only to feed and clothe them, but his principal responsibility is to guide them so that their lives will be well regulated. And he will dedicate his full attention to that. Now where do these men get these beliefs, these ideas? I believe I can make a good case that it comes from God's word. I believe Bo preached from Ephesians chapter 6 during Mother's Day. You can turn there to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. What does it say? It says, And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. One commentator says that Paul addressed fathers specifically in this passage because Paul knew that it would be all too easy for fathers to put this responsibility upon their wives. And I believe I see this at times within the church and in the world, that it falls on the mother to be the, the spiritual guide in the family, to do the spiritual training in the family. And I believe it is easy for us as fathers to allow our wives to, to carry this load. But don't you know that God addresses fathers specifically and that he wants us to bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. This word admonition, it means counsel or warning. So God wants the father to teach their children, to counsel their children, and to train them. And so let's turn back to the book of Deuteronomy. And let's reread re verse 7. You shall teach them, you shall teach your children diligently. This word diligently means characterized by steady, earnest, and energetic effort. So fathers, if you will for a moment ask yourself, are 
we teaching our children diligently? Do we teach our children steadily and earnestly and energetically? Because this is what God commands us. He commands us to teach our children diligently in the way that they should go. And when are we to teach them the, these things? It says, and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. I don't know about you, but that seems like um, Moses is saying constantly. Teach them constantly, all of the time. Teach them about the things of God and what he is like. And teach them about the things of God. Now, I do understand that, me, that we as men and fathers, we are busy. I understand that we have wives to love. We have bills that need to be paid. We have rent and mortgages that need to be paid and work that needs to be done. I understand that, that we live in a busy time. But it's for that very reason that we need to pay special attention to how we are spending both our time and our money. I believe that it's been said multiple times from this pulpit that you can tell what matters most to a person by observing how they spend their time and their money. Now, I know that money is a, a touchy subject, but to me, money is nothing more than an extension of power. Um, if, if you have lots of money, you can do certain things that other people won't be able to do. You can build a house, you can donate to charity, you can, you can do a lot of different things, but it's really an extension of power. And we don't need to be a fan of Dave Ramsey to understand what God says about money in the Bible. And especially as it pertains to debt. In Proverbs chapter 22, verse 7, what does God's word say about debt? He says that the borrower is a servant or a slave to the lender, right? That's in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 7. And the simple reality of it is the more expenses, bills, subscriptions that we have, the more expenses that we have, more time we're going to have to spend to pay off those expenses, to pay off those bills, which means less time for the family, less time for family instruction. And so we need to pay special attention to how we are spending our money, not to hoard it, but the more money that we have saved up, the more leverage we have to say that, hey, I don't need to work this overtime at work. I have what I need to provide for my family. And I do understand that there may be a season in our lives as men and women where we need to work overtime. I understand that we have bills that need to be paid. And those things are necessary. We need electricity and water and a place to live and clothing. We need these things. But nonetheless, I'm sure that there are some things in our lives that we don't need, right? God knows that I don't want to drive a 2006 Toyota Corolla. But don't you know that it's really nice not to have a car payment, right? Um, and there's so many different subscriptions out there today that people can subscribe to. Netflix, Spotify, Amazon Prime, just to name a few. Do we really need all of those things? I'm not saying that we can't spend anything on entertainment, but we need to pay special attention to how we are spending our money and how we budget our money. Because if we do, I believe that we will have more time to spend with our children to teach them. And we also have to address the issue of time management as well, right? Um, one person says, or is a well-known said, well-known saying that time is what? Time is money, money right? Um, do I have any Josh Turner fans? Heck yeah, Tyler. We got a few. So Josh, Josh Turner has a song called Time is Love. And God knows I'm not a singer, but uh, I'll read the lyrics for you. That song goes, time is love, gotta run. Love to hang longer, but I've got someone who waits. Waits for me, and right now she's where I need to be. Time is love. The, the more time we have in our lives the more time we're going to have to spend with our children, teaching them, training them, and just playing with them. 
And also on the subject of time management, I, I realized that I could speak on numerous things, but God has laid it upon my heart to address the topic of social media. Aren't you people glad? Um, and especially TikTok. Um, and any platform that utilizes short little snippets of video. And I believe that most of us probably are aware of what those videos are like on Facebook or TikTok where you just start scrolling. And it's almost as if that platform, that site is catering specifically to you. Like you watch a video and it's like, oh, I like this video. Let me watch another one. And it keeps coming back to, to more and more videos that you actually like. Some people relate these, specifically that type of platform where you're watching short little snippets of video to crack cocaine because you're getting short little boosts of dopamine. And isn't it really easy to, to get started on one of those sites and just stay on it for who knows how long? Um, but I want to provide you just a, a few statistics about um, specifically TikTok. Um, if you spend 90 minutes or more a day uh, on this, on TikTok or any type of social media website, you are in effect killing your attention span. Uh, you are wounding it and our attention spans are, are decreasing when we use these types of sites. Um, and not only that, over 50% of the population that utilizes this, this app are children under the age of 24. Now why is that? scary because it's scary because a lot of these children are still at an age where their brains are still developing and I, I have the opportunity to work with some of these children in my job I, I work with with children anywhere between 11 and 18 and I already knew that children's attention spans are already really low but um, especially now it's scary how how small these children's attention spans are. Um, and some of them, it's crazy to me, don't even know how to read or how to spell their name. It's really a, a scary thing. So I, I say all of this not to say that we need to delete social media or anything like that. But I would say that we, we do need to ask ourselves as we're scrolling on our phones this week, is this what I want to teach my child? Do I want to see little baby Alaska, my daughter, do I want to see her in her bed one day just glued to her phone, just scrolling? Don't. Do I want to see her at the dinner table one day scrolling? Because don't you know that what we as parents, fathers and mothers, what we, um, what we put out, what we show our children, they're going to follow suit. Yeah. So please ask yourself this week as you're scrolling, is this what I want to teach my child? And if your child happens to utilize any type of online uh, social media platform, please, please be present in your child's own online presence. Because a lot of these websites seem uh, safe enough at first and appropriate enough at first, but very quickly you can go down a rabbit hole and it, God knows what some children see when they're on these websites. So. I just want to include that in my message today because I believe that if we're not careful about taking care of our attention span, what are the odds that we're actually going to sit down during a sermon and pay attention to, what, 30 minutes, 45 minutes that someone gives a sermon? What are the odds that we will actually be able to do that? What are the odds that we will actually sit down and read God's Word? if we are, in effect, killing our attention spans. Um, there's atheists and agnostics and people in other religions who have actually read the Bible all the way through. And they don't even believe what we believe. Can we as Christians say the same thing, that we, one, read the Bible, and two, can we even say that we have read even complete books of the Bible? When you get into the New Testament, there's a very brief books like Colossians, Ephesians, Philippians, Galatians. It, they consist of like four to six chapters. Can we say that we can actually sit down and read that entire book in one setting? Or is our attention span so bad that we can't even do that? So we as fathers need to pay attention to how we are 
spending our time, how we are managing our time, and also how our children are managing their time as well. So not to make this a message about time and money, because it would be really easy for me to do that. Let's move on. And so I hope that I've conveyed enough that we can affirm God's spirit and character in the way that we love our children. If we love our children rightly, it's very likely that they will believe that God the Father loves them also. And so in that way, we teach our children who he is, who God the Father is, and what he is like. But let's move on to the next side of the coin, where we teach our children what the proper response towards God should be. What do we want to teach our children about what our response to God should be? What should be our response? I believe that there's one thing that we need to help our children understand is this. We must help them understand that they desperately need to depend upon Christ. Or one of the best ways that we can honor God is by embracing his son and depending upon Jesus the son. That's one of the best things that we can teach our children. And so I would ask all of you today, both fathers and mothers alike, if I were to talk to your children, to your grandchildren, would they characterize you in that way? Would they characterize you and describe you in such a way where they can say that my pa, he depends upon Christ? In Deuteronomy chapter 8, just a few chapters over in verse 3, Moses says this. He says, so he humbled you, so God humbled you, allowed you to hunger, and fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. By every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. Do, do our children see that we take words like that to heart? Do they see us getting into God's word and actually reading it and depending upon it? To provide just a brief illustration, I, I remember as a young boy waking up in the wee hours of the morning to go use the bathroom. And I can't tell you how many times I would see my dad on the back porch, usually still at night or in the dark, reading his Bible and praying for the family. And not only that, I'm thankful to say that I, I can remember that not only about him, but about my mom as well. I remember waking up in the morning and she would be in the living room with a lamp reading her Bible and praying for her family. Can our children say the same about us? Will they say that about us one day when they grow up? Will they have memories of us spending time with God, reading the word and praying? I say this not to pat myself, myself on the back, but I, I personally have a daily quiet time. I, I try to do it the first thing in the morning. And I can't tell you how many times my young daughter, she's three years old, she'll come into the bedroom and she'll see me beside the bed on my knees with my Bible in front of me, praying and reading the Bible. I realize that she's not yet at an age where she understands the gravity of what I'm doing. But you better bet that she's going to grow up knowing that her pa depends upon Christ. I tell you that I cannot get up here and speak without Jesus enabling me and speaking through me. I cannot be the, the husband that I need to be or the father that I need to be without Jesus and depending upon him. And so do our children know that we depend upon Christ? If they see that in us, I believe that they will learn that they need to depend upon Christ. And so again, are we getting into the word daily to show that we don't only live by food alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Do our children see us praying? Because that is the sign of dependency upon God. Prayer is the open admission that we need help. And God knows that we need help. So do our children see us praying regularly? And I want to say this, this next thing, especially, do our children know that we prioritize godly community? Again, women get this a little bit better than men because men often think that they can do it alone. 
But don't you know that you don't have to do it alone? That we need godly men and brothers in our lives to help us. When I was a student in high school, I, I ran cross country. And in many ways, running is a, an individual sport. But in cross country, the way the scoring works is that you run as a unit of seven runners. And you're only as fast as your slowest runner. Because that's, that's just how the scoring works. It works much like golf. You want the, the lowest score as possible. But don't you know that when you're running as a pack, when you get discouraged or tired, if you have other godly men beside you, running beside you, they can encourage you and help you when you become discouraged. It was not too long ago that I probably went through one of the darkest seasons of my life. And don't you know that both Tyler and Micah and Bo and others here, they were present during that time. And they came to my home and prayed over me and laid hands upon me. And I wonder if if that season would have been extended if they did not actually um, have a presence in my life. I believe that they very much helped me get out of that season. And I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for a godly community. So I say this because can, can our children say that we prioritize godly brothers and sisters who, who hold us accountable? And so I realize that I've, I've, I've said a whole bunch today, and hopefully none of it has been too harsh. Um, but I, I want to end on Deuteronomy chapter 6, um, verse 9. You shall write them, these words are the commands, you shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. I believe one way that we as fathers and mothers and just children of God, one way that we can rise up today is that we can honor God by writing some of his word on index cards and posting it in our home. And so if, if you saw me, I put index cards um, at the front here. And what I challenge specifically fathers to do is to, to take an index card today and to find a passage in the Bible, a short passage that you can post somewhere in your home. It can be in the bathroom or on the door frame, somewhere in your home where you will see it and where your children will see it. A good uh, suggestion would be Proverbs 3, 5 through 6, which says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall make your paths straight. You don't have to utilize that one, but find something that, that resonates within your heart, that you can see each day. And I challenge all of you who choose to do this, both men and women alike, uh, take a card today, write down the verse, tape it somewhere in your house, and take a picture of it, because I'm going to take a picture of mine. Um, I'm going to post it somewhere on my house. I'm, I'm going to post it on the, the Facebook um, profile of the River Church. And I want everyone to comment below and put what verse you put up in your house, if you are willing enough to do that. Um, but besides that, I encourage all of you fathers and just everyone here um, to depend upon Christ. Because when we do that, we will teach our children to depend upon Christ. And so with that, let's pray. Father, I thank you for helping me to, to deliver this message. And that you would utilize it in the way that you want to utilize it. And that you would help us fathers, that you would help us mothers, and just everyone here to be the men and women that you want us to be, that we would honor you. And I pray for everyone here that you would move within them, that you would stir your spirit within them to make whatever response that they need to make for today. If they need to do business with you, I pray that they would do it at the altar and that you would help them to be fathers and mothers and people that you want us to be. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.